first part of this morning is actually going to be, we're going to focus on what it means to follow Christ in our workplaces. And to get us started, we'll hear from Bill Hendricks, the chair of, uh, for the 2024 Summit Organizing Committee, whom you met last night. Bill, Bill thank you, uh, when he comes out, thank you to you and the Dallas Seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary, for generously hosting the 2024 Summit event. And I believe Bill is going to come out in just a moment. Hey, I'm like Mark. I thought I was on tomorrow, and they said, get out there and <laughs> say something. So here I am. Folks, I, I want to ask you to indulge me. Uh, the Lord has given me some facility with words. Unfortunately, it's to put them on paper, <clears throat> not so much to spontaneously speak. And, uh, and so I've kind of got a script here. Now, if we were talking about giftedness, I'd talk about that all day long with no script, but we're not talking about giftedness this morning. We're talking about following Christ in our workplace, which is a wonderful aspiration. But the sad truth is, almost all Christians in America go to work every day as what I would call secularists, by which I mean they simply leave God at home and they do their work as if God didn't exist. And we know why that's, why that's the case, don't we? It's because of the 2,000-pound elephant in the room that we call the sacred-secular dichotomy. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes. And just, I don't want to assume that everybody in the room even knows what that term means, sacred-secular dichotomy. It's basically the idea that some things are sacred, some things are secular. So God, the Bible, church, prayer, th those are sacred categories. And then things like everyday work and money for sure and profit and contracts and bulldozers and pest control, th those are secular things. And how that splits out when we get to occupations is that pastors and missionaries, uh, and, and Christian leaders, they're, they're doing what's called sacred work. They're in ministry. And then public school teachers, cops, managers in a corporation, steel workers, investment bankers, certainly lawyers, they're secular. <laughs> and, you know, my dad actually, that, that was like the, the basis of a, of a favorite joke he used to pull. He'd, he'd have a group of workplace Christians in front of him and he'd go, hey, I'm ordained. I'm paid to be good. The rest of you are good for nothing. <laughs> but, but it's a real thing. So in September, the Lausanne Network is having a, a giant meeting in Seoul, Korea. The Lausanne Network was founded back in the 1970s by Billy Graham, Leighton Ford, and John Stott to deal with the problem, how do we, how do we get evangelism to the ends of the earth? It's a wonderful vision. And they've had about three conferences, and this is the fourth major gathering that they're having. So they're going to have 5,000 people in Seoul, Korea. 2,000 of those folks will be in what is called the workplace track, thanks to Jerry White and Joseph Vijayam, who are here with us. And they'll be hearing about and giving assent to this truth that Jesus is Lord and therefore Everything in life matters. There is no sacred versus secular. And meanwhile, the other 3,000 will be missionaries, pastors, denominational officials, other church leaders. And to one degree or another, many, not all, but many, and perhaps most, will continue to sort of treat certain categories in life as godly and having eternal value and therefore, it's a higher calling if you deal with those things, while everyone else is secular and temporal and therefore less important. 2,000, 3,000. I don't know, that strikes me as ironic, odd, troubling. I don't know what word to put on it. And I'm not even sure what to do about it. But that, friends, is a microcosm of the larger global church. The sacred-secular divide, in my judgment, remains our main problem, theologically speaking. And remains is the operative word. You see, the dualism 
of the sacred, secular divide has existed since before the church ever existed. And it permeated the church early on. So by now it's been around for thousands of years. And it hangs on to Christianity the way dog dirt hangs on to a shoe. You see, the dualism of the sacred secular dichotomy has, ex I'm sorry, one of my theology professors declared this sacred secular divide as the greatest heresy that we're dealing with today, and I think he was spot on, because it contradicts the divinity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, and the lordship of Christ. And on top of that, it denies the human being as a body-soul unity. And I could go on, but the sacred secular divide hangs on mostly because it's what Paul described in 2 Corinthians 10. It's a stronghold. That word means a fortress built and defended on a combination of intellectual arguments and spiritual pretensions. And Paul says those kinds of fortresses of our hearts and our minds need to be taken captive and made obedient to Christ the King. I'm all for that, but it's a tall order. Because the sacred secular divide not only affects, it infects just about everything we now call Christianity. It's deeply enculturated, it's systemic. It's in our theology, it's in our hermeneutics, it's in the way we educate and train our leaders, it's in our liturgy, it's in our hymns, it's in our worldview, it's in our language, it's in our mission statements, it's in our philanthropy, it's in the way we disciple people, it's in the way we evangelize people, it's even in the perceptions of those outside our faith have of us. So what do we do? Well, the Apostle John says that light always dispels darkness. Praise God. So the best way to counter a lie is to boldly and persistently cast a vision for what is true. And our truth is a beautiful truth. It's a magnificent truth. It's a compelling truth and an inspiring truth because it's based on the core truth of who God is. God is love. God is infinite and eternal love. And in Christ, in his infinite love, God created the world and all that is in it. So how could God, in his infinite and eternal love, not love anything and everything he has created? How can his love ever be segmented or prioritized into categories or levels of love, as if he loves some things more than others? Even now, after our first parents rebelled against God and fell into sin, and we became estranged from God with them, God's love for us and for this world remains. And through Christ, who is God with us, all things are being reconciled back to God. And that's already happening right now. God created the world and all that is in it, and we must never forget that this world and its people were designed and destined to flourish. And by flourishing, I mean in right relationship with the Creator and functioning as the creation was intended. Our salvation is not an end in itself. It's a means whereby we are put back into right standing with God so that, in order that, to the end that, we would be able to cause the world and its people to flourish as God intended. We do that through our work. We will not see that vision fully realized until King Jesus comes back again. But the kingdom he rules already has begun. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, we do what we can to live and work in kingdom-minded ways and to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to those who are still in darkness and trapped there and are dead in their trespasses and sins. 
The lie of the, so, the, lie of the sac, sacred secular dichotomy is that time and space don't matter. But in the man Jesus, God demonstrated that time and space absolutely matter. The body matters. Physical structures and places matter. The temporal affairs matter. It all matters. Not only for eternity, but also for now, in this world, in this life, in your body, that God made to be his dwelling place right now. Make no mistake, in the narrative of God and his relationship to the world that I'm describing, all of the spiritual, spiritual realities still remain. But they start now in time and space. So 36 years ago, I put some of this way of thinking together into words in a book called Your Work Matters to God. And after I did, I started to discover a lot of other people who were waking up to this same truth. And in fact, I discovered that God was raising up a whole movement of people who believe that God cares about their work. And on that point, let me just say this. No one owns the faith and work movement. No one runs or manages or oversees the faith and work movement. That's why we call it a movement. For the last hundred years and more, as David helped us see last night, all over this country, people here and there have started to try and find ways to connect their faith and their work, and many of them have acted spontaneously and just on their own. In fact, by now, the vast majority of people doing things that qualify as faith and work activities, they don't even know there's such a thing as a faith and work movement. The faith and work movement is something God is doing. And if we ever forget that, if we ever start thinking that our part of the movement is the big deal in the movement, well, movements have ways of marginalizing self-appointed prima donnas and bad actors. So what do we do in response to the sacred-secular dichotomy, both as a movement and as individuals? Well, as I say, I think the main thing we're called to do is to reject that lie wherever we find it and instead live into the truth and live out the truth. If our work matters to God, then it needs to matter to us. And we need to do it as if Christ himself were doing it and do it in the way Christ himself would do it. Now, to be sure, that's going to look a bit differently for each of us. But in the few minutes I have left, I just want to suggest two ways for doing that. One has to do with the work, and the other has to do with us as workers, okay? In terms of the work, we quite simply need to regularly and continuously subject our work, whatever and wherever it is, to what one of my mentors, the late Ray Bakke, used to call theological reflection. That's just a fancy term for regularly and intentionally and creatively thinking about our work through questions like, why does this work matter to God? Where does this work fit into God's overall purpose? Which is, remember, for the world and its people to flourish. How does it connect to that purpose and contribute to it? Where do I see God in my work? And I mean in the work itself. If Jesus were doing my work, how can I imagine him doing it? And what might this work have looked like before the fall, before sin? Or what might it look like today if the fall had never happened? You get the idea. The point is that if we're going to take seriously the truth that our work matters to God, then we ought to take our work seriously and see if we can't look at it the way God looks at it. And listen, in a broken, fallen world filled with broken, fallen people among whom we are part, the natural thing is to see our work as broken and fallen. And it is. But that's all, if that's all we dwell on, 
as most people do, we will inevitably conclude that our work really doesn't matter to God, and we will head right back into a sacred-secular dichotomy. What we need today are Christians, Christ followers, who say, yeah, the world of work is a mess, but I'm going to boldly and creatively see if I can't somehow redeem my work in ways that cause the world and its people and me to flourish. And I'm going to do that because ultimately my boss in this broken, fallen system is not a broken, fallen human, but rather a perfect, risen, infinitely good, and infinitely loving human being, the reigning Lord Christ, who is reconciling all things to himself, including the work that he's called me to right now. Look, this is not a mind game that I'm suggesting. This is a move to bring the living Christ into our work and bring our work before Christ. Nothing of consequence happens apart from that. Which leads us to us as workers. Christ's plan is to reconcile our work to himself, but that starts by reconciling us as human beings to himself. And here's where the sacred-secular divide is probably causing the greatest damage, at least in our time. It promotes a gospel that specializes in spiritual birth, but ignores spiritual growth. And I'm satisfied that's one of the biggest reasons why more than 40 million people, 40 million in the United States who were attending church 25 years ago, have stopped attending church now. More people have left the church in the last <clears throat> 25 years than all the people who came to faith in the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and all the Billy Graham crusades combined. I think the American church needs to seriously revisit the process by which Christ is reconcil reconciling human beings to himself. And I believe the faith and work movement is perfectly positioned to exercise leadership in that project. But the strategy I would recommend is counterintuitive. While I encourage us to always be on the lookout for moments of evangelism, let me repeat that. I encourage us to always be on the lookout for moments of evangelism. We've got to make discipleship our priority. We have got to make discipleship our priority, following Christ our priority. In other words, we must pay more attention to how we are following Christ as we do our work than whether we're having spiritual influence on others. Now, I know that for many, that sounds like utter heresy. But in fact, it's exactly the approach the earliest Christians took during the first four centuries of the church. Recorded history shows that the earliest Christians had no strategy for evangelism. None. Their attitude was, that's God's business. He's calling out a people unto himself. Our job is to worship God and to follow the teachings of Jesus, which for them basically meant the Sermon on the Mount. And as you know, that sermon deals with some really basic matters like anger, like sexual immorality, like marital relationships, like keeping your word, how we react when wronged, how to deal with people who are our enemies, how to bring our needs before God, what to do about anxiety, what our perspectives should be on material needs, and so on. You know, most of that teaching sounds more like people issues than workplace issues, right? But that's the point. For most of us, the biggest problem at work is not the work, it's the people at the work. So teaching on relationships is always relevant. Anyway, the earliest Christians just lived that stuff out, often at considerable cost to themselves, including their very lives. But that didn't seem to matter. They cared more about experiencing God and seeing his power enable them to develop and live into his character. Look, I'm utterly committed to evangelism because people absolutely need a savior. They need the gospel. But what the world our world, our nation anyway, needs right now is not more converts, but more Christ followers. 
There's a massive difference between the two. A convert has made a decision. A Christ follower has also made that decision. But then they act on that decision daily over time as they learn from Jesus. And what is it that they're learning? Well, no one said it better than Dallas Willard. I'm learning from Jesus how to lead my life, my whole life, my real life. Note, please, I am not learning from him how to lead his life. His life on earth was a transcendently wonderful one, but it has now been led. Neither I nor anyone else, even himself, will ever lead it again. And he is, in my case, interested in my life, that very existence that is me. There lies my need. I need to be able to lead my life as he would lead it if he were I. And when we Christians start leading our lives and doing our work the way Jesus would do it if he were us, I guarantee the people around us will take notice and start asking, what's up? At least that's what happened for the earliest Christians. You see, the stench of the sacred-secular divide is very off-putting to those who don't know God. But the aroma of Christ is like, well, it's like a scent of heaven on earth. As Wendell Berry put it, there are no unsacred places, there are only sacred places and desecrated places. And Andrew Peterson picks up on that insight to say that there are no unsacred moments There are only sacred moments and moments we have forgotten are sacred. If that's true, then it is our duty to reclaim the sacredness of our lives, of life itself. And the first step is to remember, to remember the dream of Eden that shimmers at the edges of things, to remember that the madman on the corner was made in God's image, to remember that work and play and suffering and celebration are all sentences in a good story being told by God, a story arcing its way to eternity. By remembering the holiness of each moment, we banish the old Gnostic ghost. He's talking about the sacred-secular divide. We banish the old Gnostic ghost and thwart its lie that there's nothing holy about flesh and bone, soil and stone, work and pleasure, and all tangible, tactile, visible things. Amen. I want to invite our panel to come out. Take a moment to introduce yourselves briefly. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Nowlin. I'm the founder of the Metron Manager Project and uh, author of the book, Managing Your Metron. I'm a redemptive business consultant with a long history in career missions work globally and now developing uh, redemptive companies and organizations. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, I'm Hannah Stoles. I'm the William E. Crenshaw Endowed Chair in Supply Chain Management at Baylor University. And I work at the intersection of transformative supply chain research and faith and business strategy integration. My name is Zabi Koka, and um, for this session, I would like to be introduced as an accidental author. <laughs> I was just trying to find the problems within the church and ended up with two dissertations that now has come out to be two books, Church Beyond Walls, Demystifying the Sacred and Secular Work Divide for Community Transformation, and then Church Beyond Optics, Transforming Cities with Hope Agenda. So you've written on the sacred secular divide, a whole book, which I recommend. So let me, let me start with you, Abby. As you listen to what we've talked already about in the sacred secular divide, where have you seen that most expressing itself and creating problems? It's a big problem in the church. And, um, well, you talk about Ray Bucky, and I want to start with something that I heard from Ray that actually motivated me to look into the problem. Ray stated that 85% of barriers for effective city reach by the church is within the church. That's more than 2,000 gorilla pounds in the room. And so, um, but the first thing to look at happened to be the sacred-secular work divide. 
And um, it's not just a nuance. It's, not just, it's even beyond the world view. It's a theological framework that has incapacitated the professionals in the workplace. It's a lie. It's a myth. And the only way to confront that is by the truth. And that truth is actually what you have expanded this morning. And the truth is the fact that it's not about the location of the work. It's about the lordship. And if it's not the Lord outside the church, beyond the church walls, it's not the Lord at all. The lordship of Jesus is beyond Sunday morning, is beyond just gathering. It must affect the scattering of the, of the church in the workplace. So Hannah, you, you've spent your career really in what I think is called supply chain management, which we all discovered was a thing during the pandemic. <laughs> and I'm just curious, you know, how has that affected your perceptions of this whole conversation? Yeah, uh, I think um, I'm, I'm grateful that we're all more aware of supply chain management now. I wish it weren't toilet paper and vaccines. But, um, you know, the truth of the matter is that there's, there's well, I'll start here with the, the theological perspective. And I love this. This is an N.T. Wright quote that just kind of blew my mind. And sometimes, you know, going back to that salvation moment with that, um, we can have a mindset that we're saved from this world in salvation. And I think actually that the, the, the truer truth <laughs> is that we're saved for this world. Amen. And so when we understand the, the redemptive act of the cross and the God who loves us, we're not just redeemed, but we become, you know, co-workers in what Christ is doing in this world. And when you think about supply chain management, and maybe nobody in this room has thought about it as much as me, but God has always cared about supply chain management. Um, the first miracle that saved the whole world was a warehousing miracle in Genesis 50. Um, Joseph, you know, he, he built the biggest warehouse. The world was saved. And so when we, we think about <laughs> God has always really cared about people's work and meeting people's needs through different systems. And one of those systems is business. And so I think when you think about supply chain management, the opportunities there, we land in Matthew 25. And Jesus comes back and separates the sheep and the goats. And it's not who went to the most church services. It's not who prayed the most, though we should do both of those things. Really what separated the sheep and the goats were people who had, had, had you know, a profit. They had margin to give food to the hungry mm. and to give drink to those who were thirsty and to clothe those who were naked. And in, in the world I live in, that's logistics flows. <laughs> and that's supply chain management. How are you moving product to where people need it. How, how are you helping people and meeting their needs? Because it's a physical expression of the love of God. Well, thank you. You have just demonstrated what we talked about in theological reflection <clears throat> on work. Thank you. Yeah. Jonathan? <clears throat> yeah, when I saw some of the topics on this, I had an interesting uh, story pop to mind right before I came here, actually. I was uh, having coffee with a friend of mine. He's in banking. And he actually disciples a lot of people in their workplace roles and different things in my community. And he was downloading a problem he'd just run into. And it kind of ties back to what you're talking about, making holistic Christ followers, not just converts. It was this young, uh, zealous business owner, this guy had been discipling. He had a landscaping company, and he had been for a couple years discipling this guy, and he was really thinking he'd gotten a hold of it. And the guy was running with it. He was running his company as a really a faith-driven enterprise. And he was pushing Bible studies really hard. He was doing very evangelistic. He was very spiritual. But then just last week, they ran into this problem where their company really messed up a significant job. And they got called out on it and asked to fix it to make it right. And the guy wouldn't do it. And he walked away from this situation. He was not... His problem was that the Bible studies were sacred, the landscaping was secular, mm. and, it, the, and he wasn't willing to pay a price on integrity to be Christ in that situation. 
Well, unfortunately, it blew up two years of work with his staff because he lost his moral authority, he lost his credibility, his spiritual authority, his authenticity, all of it was gone. And my friend who had been discipling this guy was like, what did I do wrong for two years? How, how could this even happen when it came to this situation? So he's basically living as a functional Gnostic. Mm-hmm. And that was the dilemma. And I see that in my work with uh, developing companies. And that's where, largely what they're trying to initially get around is reconciling, reintegrating a disintegrated life. Mm. Yeah, could I, could I jump on that? Yeah, please you know, do. This is such a great example and um, not... In the, the research that I do, with, which is with Fortune 1000, Fortune 500, you know, big companies, and there are very sacred people working in spaces that we won't call secular, but we actually ran a, a research study looking at these exact things, not, not in a Christian-based space, but looking at what happens when you get it wrong, whether it's in terms of how you treat people, there's issues with money, there's issues with, you know, waste or environmental issues, and you know what we found across our research study, thousands of participants in this research, is that when people say, I'm sorry, when they repent and they fix it, that actually brand loyalty increases, yeah. future purchase intentions increase. And so there are sacred truths in spaces that aren't even processing it from that perspective, that God's truth is so powerful, it shows up in the Fortune 1000, that when people repent, there's some power to that. So as Christians, we should really, really own it. I love that example. Well, um, I agree with um, all of that, and um, it points to one thing is that discipleship should not be done in a bubble. There should be a net goal to discipleship. I know we've been talking about it. So what actually is the end goal of the discipleship process, discipleship label? The church is not doing well with that because there's no end goal. We disciple just for, you know, within the walls. But when we go into the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 17, we discover that when the disciples were to be called out, they said, those who have changed the world upside down have come here. So our discipleship must actually, though it's not activism, but it must be able to address unjust systems and structures. And where do we find this? It's not within the church walls. It's beyond the church walls. But it has to start in the church. People must be mobilized and equipped for the transformation of the city. And that's what it should be. It should not just be an ending itself. It must have a purpose. And so going forward from this summit... Is something that we need to look into. I mean, I love the testimony from Coca-Cola. Who will ever believe such a thing is happening outside church walls? And that's what it should be. Because right now we see that it's even done much better outside the church walls than within. I think one thing we have to factor in here is for each of us to consider kind of what is in our control because obviously there's people all up and down a ladder of responsibility and and that's why you know people who are in the in the c-suite or or the owner of the company or whatever have massive responsibility it seems to me for the kind of culture that they create and and they they intentionally create in in their enterprise and we've got some workshops about that this afternoon. And meanwhile, you know, there's somebody else who's in a cubicle. And I mean, they, they've got, you know, like they feel like they got five bosses. You know, they, they don't have any control. But I always point out, well, that desk you're at right there and that computer in front of you, it may only be, you know, like three square yards, but that's your, that's your turf. Whatever happens there, you need, to, you need to do it for the kingdom. You need to make it kingdom-minded. And you say, well, Bill, all I do is file you know, insurance claims, process insurance claims. How does that matter to God? I'm like, are you kidding me? Have you filed a health insurance claim recently? <laughs> Listen, I'm on the prayer team at my church, and I've had people literally come back to get prayer. They are torn up. And I'm like, what's going on? They go, I need prayer. My husband needs this procedure. 
and it's all hung up in the insurance. The insurance won't approve it until this form gets filled out, and, that, you know, and, it, and it's just a nightmare for them. I'm going, well, let's pray. We're praying for this person and her husband. Somebody over here has, has got that responsibility to get that thing filed. God cares about that stuff because he cares about this lady and her husband. So wherever our place in the food chain is, we need to seize it for the kingdom. So, you know, I gave a couple ideas of, you know, think theologically about your work and then focus on discipleship. But those are kind of at a 30,000-foot level. Help us think, how would we drive that down into some practical steps? Like, what, what would that look like? Go ahead, Jonathan. Sure. Well, I, that's kind of the area I'm, I'm working in and specializing in is with a program I have called the Ways of Work. We're actually shape corporate culture at the ground level in the trenches with companies. Mm. And it's got to work out in real life. It's got to be practical and it's got to be workable for non-believers in the workplace. So getting into uh, that area and that space of culture building is really um, what I've found to be the the missing link, especially for small to mid-sized companies. They just don't have time to put any thought into that. Mm. It's usually an afterthought. And that, you know, Human nature is the path of least resistance. It always goes downhill. <laughs> and that's largely what you find in a company when you leave this unattended, unpastored, or unpa- you know, uncultivated, as we say. So that's an area that I found has to be worked out ideally. I, I try to do that through uh, mentorship or executive coaching with uh, influencers and in companies. They've got to learn to manage their influence. They've got to learn to set culture. They've got to learn. The approach I take is I don't want you just to be a disciple. I want you to be a kingdom operator mm. because I want you to have the same skill set, the same mindset, the same understanding, and the same upskilling spiritually where I can drop you into McDonald's, I can drop you into homeschooling your kid, or I can drop you into a presidential role, and you're going to do it the same way. You're going to do God. You're going to do things God's way in God's universe, and you're going to be blessed. So will the people around you. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it comes down to the simple truths of, you know, if going into workplaces, thinking about that we want to love God and we want to love people. And whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, we all want to be loved. We all want to be in community. And uh, I think there's a lot of work in kind of the leadership development, the culture development spaces. And it's the, the C-suite is the fun space. And I think we also need an imagination for, you know, for the, the front line for what does this organization look like for workers? Because if we build a, you know, a value statement, a mission, a mission statement that's kind of based on our Christian principles and then it doesn't filter down through the organization so that the jobs our frontline employees are showing up and doing every day are a blessing to them and their families, we actually do more of a disservice to the gospel than we do you know, creating a blessing for the people that are working there. So if you work in a, a really large company, you know, I've, I've worked with organizations, 40,000 employees, 18,000 of them are frontline truck drivers. So how does the, the value and the mission statement of that organization bless those truck drivers mm-hmm. and um, create a workspace that they come into and they're glad to be in business with you? And then, um, you know, one of the ways that we've measured kind of corporate performance or corporate social responsibility for lots of years is just through philanthropy. And so I don't know if you've ever been at church where there's a mindset of just go out and make lots of money. Nobody asks how you do it so that you can fund kingdom work. Instead of saying, think about how you're making this money so that you can do kingdom work, because we're all called as members of the church to do kingdom work. And so thinking about, you know, if if Boaz wasn't both excellent at business, but also socially aware, there would have been no margins for Ruth to glean in. So we have to be excellent at what we do, but understand the space that what we do creates opportunities for people to understand the love of God. That's the end goal. It's not to make lots of money. It's to have margin so that we can express the blessing of God that we've experienced so that others can come into that kingdom space as well. Right. Um, I will go also with David Miller's um, testimony yesterday about his experience in Atlanta with that bus driver. Make it about the people. People count. And one of the evidence of having kingdom values is actually loving the people. I mean, the bus driver said, work is hard, but I love the people. I mean, she asked about David's welfare. Mm-hmm. How is your family? You look tired. You look swamped. Do you know Jesus? I mean, 
It doesn't have to be that explicit, but show interest in people, in their welfare. That makes a whole lot of difference. That's how Jesus will do the work. And that's how we should at least let people know that that's the way to do the work. It makes a whole lot of difference. I mentioned that uh, the secular secular divide infects the language that we use. Um, and I guess one of the more pronounced illustrations of that, I, I'm, I'm going to sort of throw out a challenge to all of us. So back in 2006, I was asked to be on the steering committee for the Theology of Work project. And about a year into it, uh, I asked the rest of the committee members, okay, we've got, we know what to call the clergy, right? We all know who the clergy are. So what do we call everybody else? And, you know, Ephesians 4 calls, calls us the saints, but that term got co-opted way back early, and now it doesn't mean what, you know, Paul meant. So what do we call them? And I, I never, nobody, nobody, we never came up with an answer to that question. And I actually started to offer a prize. I said, I'll give $1,000 to anybody who can come up with a decent name for everyday Christians. Um, so far, nobody's claimed that prize. Um, it's, a, it's a conundrum to me. Because just by having a name for one and no name for the other, imagine having children and you go, well, this, this is Billy. Well, who's this? Well, that's baby Hendrix. Like, you, you, see, you, you see how that, that's a problem. We feel like, do we belong? Anyway, I throw that. I don't know if I'll, I don't know. I may, I may not have $1,000 anymore. <laughs> well, I, can, I could comment on that, actually. I, I appreciate the thinking along that line. One of the things I help uh, people get a lens on is how, how do you see other fellow uh, believers or just humans in general? And one of the ways I've approached it is you view them as sent ones. So they're all sent by God into a space God's assigned them, no matter what level they are in the company, even if it's your child, yeah. they're still a sent one. And that then changes the equation on how you handle people in the workplace when you view them with that level of dignity and that co-commissioned responsibility and identity they have from the Lord. Uh, even if you have hierarchy, obviously, in a company, it levels the playing field in how people are treated. And one of the skill sets that I've helped them emphasize is you need to, you need to use a, a workplace, faith-driven version of unconditional positive regard mm. in the workplace on how you treat people. And it's been game changer, just a couple simple basic principles on that, but viewing people as sent ones. And even the non-Christians, we call them pre-sent ones because they all have a role God has for them. But it, it, we're out of time, but it, it dovetails, Abby, with what you were saying about we can always, always pay attention to the people and show them love. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a psychologist on the West Coast at, at Biola who says that most people, the difference between being heard, in other words, being attended to, being noticed, and being loved, is so close that they can't tell the difference. And that's kind of what we need in this culture that by the day is causing us to lose our humanity.